Good morning, I'm Mark Spiegler, director of Art Basel. Thank you all for coming out so early on the day after the big day. I think a lot of people were celebrating last night, so I know it's tough, but I think it's gonna to be totally worth it. Um, this is the first of the Art Basel Conversation Series this week. Um, we will start today with a conversation between the sculptor Thomas Schutte. He almost needs no introduction, but I'll do a quick one anyway. Um, his exhibition list reads like uh, an encyclopedia of all the greatest museums of the world. Most recently, um, he has been at the Serpentine Pavilion in London, the Castello de Rivoli in Turin, and he will have a show here in October at the Fondation Beiler. Um, he's also the winner of a great many awards, including the 2005 Golden Lion at the Venice Biennial, which gives me a segue to our moderator, Massimiliano Gioni, who is the curator of the current Venice Biennial, um, which many of you saw or many of you are about to see. Uh, the rest of the week in Art Basel Conversations continues <coughs> with tomorrow's panel on museums in the time of austerity, Friday's panel on collecting new media and digital art, uh, Saturday's panel, uh, which will be part of the second of an, a series that we just started in Hong Kong, which is called The Artist and the Gallerist. And it's about, it's a discussion between uh, artist and gallerist, which we feel is one of the most essential relationships uh, within the art world. In this case, it will be, Massim uh, it'll be uh, Massimo Minini and Dan Graham. And then last but not least, on Sunday, we have the continuation of the artistic practice uh, series of panels that Hans Ulrich Obrist has done. This one is called The Artist as Farmer. In addition to which, we have a whole huge extension, extensive program of salon topics, which you'll find in here. Um, you'll never make it to all of them, because it's about 30 hours of talks and panels. But all of them will be available online um, in, as part of our collaboration with The Absolute Company, which is a supporter of this series. So without further ado, because you didn't wake up early to see me, I'm going to hop off stage and let them take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you to Thomas. I, I also want to thank uh, particularly Theodora Vischer and uh, the Foundation Bayerle, who uh, are working on a solo exhibition with uh, Thomas this October, and they were very uh, kind also to... to uh, let me talk to him and, uh, and I think this hopefully will be the beginning of a conversation that has its climax with the exhibition in uh, October. Uh, Thomas Schutte is, uh, um, I, for me, is a great honor to be here with him today because he's an artist I uh, particularly admire and, uh, and I'm sure many of you do as well and, and particularly because of his uh, um, independence and uh, the way in which his work defies easy categorizations. Uh, his work often uh, confronts public sculpture, figurative sculpture, architecture, and uh, I think throughout these uh, many years, Thomas has found a way to be incredibly relevant in contemporary art, but also to, to cultivate a, a sort of almost at this point legendary isolation, I think, uh, which uh, makes him one of the, the most singular voices at work today. So it's really an honor to, to be able to talk to him today. And uh, maybe we'll just start uh, with a question. I, I wanted to start and of course, you can always skip any question you don't like, Thomas, but uh, maybe start from uh, uh, the beginning of your work in Dusseldorf and, uh, and uh, when you were at the academy there. I mean, it's, it doesn't happen often, at least to me, that you, know, you grow up studying with uh, somebody whose name is Gerhard Richter and uh, you go on to become um, Thomas Schutte. <laughs> so how did that uh, start? And, uh, what did he mean? Uh, just for information, we didn't prepare anything. Just uh, <laughs> two minutes in the back room. And uh, I, I'm not familiar with art fairs. I go there every five years, every 10 years, more or less uh, for installing. Then I disappear before the opening. And um, the situation of the 70s was a bit different than today. 
and it's al already 40 years. The 70s now reviewed look much different than they were actually were. And uh, when I was 18 or 19, uh, there was not much art. There was no art industry. There was hardly any gallery. Art fest just were invented in Cologne. And I didn't see any single show. I just went to the bibliotheque and read everything they had, like Schwitters and all the books they had. But my class went to Documenta 5, which was like three hours drive, the whole school the Seemann Documenta, and this was pretty amazing for a, for a non-trained person. And then I went again with the family of my girlfriend, so I went twice. I saw boys there talking, endless talking. <laughs> <laughs> Hundred days of talking. So you come five hours later on the way back, he's still there. <laughs> and uh, what was fascinating that in this documenta you saw uh, white paintings or hardly anything or uh, people from mental hospital and it was an awakening thing that nearly everything you want was possible even doing nothing, just like performance. I never heard that somebody can do a performance as let James Lee Byers stand on top of the roof shouting names <laughs> through a megaphone. So, and I made a couple of drawings and I applied for Düsseldorf and they took me. It was a big surprise, but at that time they took five times more people than today. And, uh, I never have seen any exhibitions or art thing before, except the normal surrealist stuff. This was youth culture, which is still today. The youth culture is very surrealist. Yeah. And the first thing is they took like 150 people, put it in a, some container, uh, and they call it the orientation thing. And I stayed there for uh, one and a half years with a guy. He's very interesting, very successful teacher, not very much known. He's called Fritz Schwegler. So Katja Fritz studied with him and many, many other people. And later on, I switched to Richter because of my friend who was a painter. And uh, I stayed a long time you know, studying. Uh, in the past was like eight or ten years, not like today, uh, you're out in three years. Because uh, they had fantastic studios, they have a heating, they serve food, and it uh, was a paradise, actually. <laughs> <laughs> was it, uh, I mean, in, in the, often in the interpretation of your work, uh, people actually stress that the beginning of your work could be seen as a reaction against the more conceptual uh, work of the time. Was it that way? I mean, the, the, the usual interpretation is that in a way you reintroduce figuration and watercolor and painting in a moment in which uh, people seem to be more interested in talking <laughs> for five or six or 10 hours and, uh, and less in the preciousness of materials. And no, there were two situations that were really brilliant that first, this was the year, just after Documenta, boys got too strange for the politician, so he was kicked out. He took hundreds of students and really can't handle this. It was a bit chaotic system, but when we, we started, he was just out and left like 150 students self-controlled in the room. And in this year, they hired a bunch of very young, successful artists like Richter, Rinke, the Bechers, Bücker, Kamp, quite a lot of very fresh uh, uh, professors. And they treated you, they treated us not as dwarfs to repeat what they are teaching, 
but to, to uh, was first-hand information we got their invitation, we got the art forum, they uh, invited, uh, like in a tiny classroom, Sarah ca came and showed his movies, uh, Buchloh was teaching there as a theory program, and they were continuously exchanged. So right from nowhere, there was a first-hand information to hang around with Lawrence Wiener in the bar. But basically, the 70s, not in retrospective, but then it was an endgame, was a Beckett endgame. So the most fashionable was not to do art, <laughs> but to keep a room empty, to put some beams on the floor, or to open the windows. Or <laughs> the the, the uh, negation was the biggest thing. And if you're young, you don't fight against your grandfather's enemies. So uh, it was interesting, what could you do possibly to get out of this trap? And uh, I did some paintings after photos, which is extremely easy to do. It takes half a day to learn it. <laughs> so I tried to, to all minimal position, I tried to put something extra, and my main subject was, in retrospective, was, I was really shocked how consequent it was. I was thinking in uh, useful terms. What can be out of use, for use? And I choose very much the decorative thing. What you see here in the entrance was uh, done as a student. This is actually a remake 20 years later. But it was a very simple thing. It's actually either Toroni or the color charts, but they work with the system, with the formula, the color charts of Richter. But I said, it could be even, but there's no formula. So I spent half a year on this, and I switched to other things. But basically, it was all about use and to be useful, which is today still a very good feeling. And uh, around that time, I think, no, it's 77. I don't want to also just talk about the beginning, but you make another sort of decorative piece, which is called Mauer, so the wall. And of course, in Germany, when you make a wall, it's not just the wall, and, uh, uh, but this was a beautiful uh, environmental painting that was a reflection on decoration, but to me at least, it also seemed like a reflection on uh, history and, uh, and Germany, which I don't know uh, how you feel about it. It's something that, that I see throughout your work, but that I'm sure you would also deny as a focus of your it practice. It's an awful lot of work. It's a, a more than a thousand little paintings, but because of this, brick shift, it was immediately a story. If it's just a normal grid, there's no story. And because of this one shift of a, of a brick wall, there's a story, and suddenly it was a stage design, and suddenly there was a story. But it wasn't the, the story of Berlin Wall or, uh, no, or not German at all. history? No, 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 no. no. Uh, this, this, you can see it afterwards, but not at that time. The basic thing is, first, it doesn't have to cost anything. And you have to put it in a bag or in a suitcase and in case somebody asks you to spend 10 days on the wall and <laughs> put the nails. There's a book on this. Actually, it was in, uh, in England on the students' work. And I still have them, which I'm very lucky on. But basically, it was all about decoration, useful. I did many things in the apartment of friends, just rehearsing shows. And if you do it in an apartment, you have to live with it. And uh, uh, so it was more or less about applied art. And now I'm very interested what I'm doing today, like doing buildings that it has to be, uh, everybody has to be happy. <laughs> if you have to live with it, you cannot shock. Yeah. You cannot kick the people in the brain every single day. <laughs> That's, uh, I mean, what you're saying about the usefulness actually lends to two 
another very important aspect in your work, which is the, the work you're doing on architecture, and uh, which you started also back, I think, already in the 70s and early 80s. I think 1981 is the first model uh, for Westkunst, and uh, throughout your work you've done models and now more and more actually livable architecture. And, uh, uh, and then on the other hand, and I'm simplifying, you have all the work about figuration and sculpture. How do you see these uh, two elements in relation to each other? And are they complementary? Are they completely unrelated? Or am I simplifying too much? No, it's even more simple. He just strolled by. I, haven't, I think he didn't get here. Didn't come here, Kaspar König. <laughs> but he took the other entrance. But perhaps he's here. So as a very young guy, he sneaked through the academy and found me somehow, just some pieces, and he found we had a meeting at McDonald's. And he proposed me for some prize. I got the prize. Was very young. Quite a lot of money. And then he uh, asked me for the Westkunst, which was a major operation. I think the first show was completely artificial architecture because it was on the fairground. And I was like 26 and developed three buildings out of the fair uh, system. And then they had a problem. They ran out of money, so they couldn't realize it. But just right after study, still as a student, I had a job to do. If they give you 10 by 20 meters free space, but no money, uh, you have to do something. There's a need, there's a commission, there's something. So I developed three models, took me one year, and at the end, the today part was nothing realized. It put it back in the hands of the galleries to finance it. I showed the models. And this was a starting point. Instead of doing abstract sculpture, like a brick on a cube on a triangle, I uh, tried to tell stories and found out there were not many artists doing models. And it's a common language. Every single child, every adult, everybody understands the language of models. They, you can reduce yourself on toy format, and the, the toy format made nearly all limits gone. It's unlimited. And, uh, and you, you, so you thought of them I could as literally models, do or? everything because they are really realistic models, they are scale models, they are thinking models, there are uh, tons of different uh, things, they are sketches. And I still do it today from time to time. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. But today, many of those models you are making as real houses and buildings, no? no the houses I only can do first because I have very good uh, clients, or very good people, who take more, all do the dirty job, the permissions. And, and I only can do it because I have hundreds in the, uh, in the archive. I take one out, transform it in a day or two, and propose it. Otherwise, if I have to develop every time a new model, I would be, uh, it would be a full-time job. Uh, so because of constantly inventing architectural structures, I'm free, I have an archive of ideas and I just can pull it out like a repertoire, yeah. like a normal actor or no, normal jazz musicians has a 500 uh, standards in his, in and his suitcase. Have yeah. you lived in the houses or spaces you design by any chance? Or? I'm very bad with myself, actually. I don't <laughs> uh, repair my bathrooms. I, I'm not good at that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I spent the night in the Yablonka house, but without curtains, it's pretty spooky in the mountains. <laughs> and what do the people that live or use them tell you about? No, the in space? the moment, there are some between temples and garden houses. Uh, they are not for full use, but the Yablonka house is uh, uh, works, yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, this makes me think of another very important 
element in your work, which is the, the idea of public sculpture or, or, uh, or the question of the monument, uh, which you have addressed many times from the, the Munster uh, public sculptures, which you realized at least on two different occasions, or the Documenta uh, Ice Shop and the, uh, the Documenta Strangers, and, uh, and then in... in uh, um, with the fourth plinth in London. So throughout your work, there is a continuous return to the idea of sculpture in the public space. Uh, no, that's not I love really... Because Thomas always says no whenever he answers a question. No, no, but it's <laughs> really not... No, I like that. <laughs> that's really not really correct, because the, the, the first things, and still today, are the summer festivals. It's not the German state or the Albanian foreign minister. It's summer festivals, and they have to keep the audience busy and entertain them. And there's always, most of them started as a joke, like the, the ice cream thing in Documenta. Uh, because even then, they had a, a, a catering problem. <laughs> they, it, half a million people come, but you don't get a decent coffee, you don't get a sandwich. It's not like today, it was no business. And by accident, the technical director was a trained architect. So I came with a turned around bucket, put a toilet on, on the back, put a roof on, and he said, yeah, we do this. So I came back three months later and it was done. It's not a big thing. Yeah. Just a crazy guy said, oh, we do this. And uh, uh, the calculation was including the taking down and uh, the same with the cherry column. I, put, I brought the model and these young curators made it possible. I came t t twice or three times. And uh, one hand was a service pavilion, the other was a city furniture. And by accident, one is gone and one still stays there. But uh, uh, it comes from these big, big shows who want to attract public, so they wanted to have it uh, something in the, in the outside spaces. And uh, I was lucky. Yeah, and what about the, the 92, uh, the, the Strangers, which is the sculpture in, in Castle on the... Um, <laughs> I don't know how much time we have. Already, already. We have plenty, unfortunately. No, yeah. Because it's a very long story. Yeah. <laughs> so people can sit down and relax. Actually, it's a story of Jan Hood, who really likes discussion and boxing with the artist. And he made a conference of eight or ten artists. And by accident, I was there. Uh, but just as a reserve person, because the Americans didn't step into a plane. They had a war in Iraq, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, the, uh, Gulf. in the Gulf, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the Americans were not traveling, so I was a reserve player. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, he's a big ego, and he wanted the big ego of the artist. And I told him, listen, I don't have an ego problem. What's your problem? Tell me what I should do your uh, institution, tell me, what's your problem? Uh, it's your problem. Uh, no, that's not my problem. <laughs> I'm, I'm not in, in, a, uh, in, a, in a need to uh, conquer a hundred, but give me a job. Yeah. And he couldn't do it. So by accident, <laughs> the building next door, which they didn't buy, was a department shop, Mr. Leffers and his uh, daughter asked for a piece for this building. And I immediately said yes, proposed something. They said yes. And uh, I developed this ceramic thing, Die Fremden, and we had no time, and virtually not much money. And we built these geometric spe uh, figures, otherwise it wouldn't be possible, and nobody ever did this life-size ceramics fired in one rush, and we actually had no damage. But it was not an invitation of Documenta. Mm -hmm. It was just opening at the same time. It was a public commission by a shop. Yeah. And the shop was so generous to make a political sculpture on top. 
and the meaning was changing every single month. In the beginning, the foreigners were officially not welcome because they take too much away. But then when this firing and uh, uh, right-wing ac ac uh, activity went too fast, now it's the 20th anniversary of just burning houses one yeah. in a row, uh, the mood turned and said, listen, it, now it's finished. And suddenly it became a monument of immigration, which I didn't know. Yeah. So yeah, very lucky. That's the, the way it's usually. And I was very lucky that I had a contract that I can leave them what I wanted. Yeah. I showed the whole production for the documenta, and then I t took 60% away afterwards, and now they are somewhere else. Yeah. But it was not a, uh, not an idea of documenta, yeah. just an accident. And um, now, 20 years later, now they even put a label. Yeah, <laughs> but it's often seen as a as a commentary on immigration, particularly in the early 90s, and uh, it has become also such a part of the landscape of uh, Castle, and uh, um, and so I wanted to go back also to this idea of uh, of the monument, if it's something you had thought about at all, because on the other hand, so much in your work is about a, a modesty and a usefulness, uh, which has nothing to do with the monument, but. Um, and yet your work is monumental, so I'm curious. In these cases, I feel like a servant. I ask for a problem, I ask for the budget, I ask for the time, and then I see what I can do. And if I'm not able to serve it, I'd say, sorry, I'm the wrong person. But in public, or in the outside, unprotected area, you can't do silly things. You have to survive somehow, but not as an ego, but the peace has to survive. Is there been any piece of yours that has been attacked or...? or um... I don't have much uh, uh, graffiti or much problem. Yeah. Because I, I, I work much more than as a consultant than an artist ego. I always check out what's, what not to do. And To be lucky is the main thing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there are misunderstandings and you get really frustrated. Or, but I'm, I'm pretty lucky in, in not failing too much because I learn very easily from other people's mistakes. Yeah. How is the, the Man in Mud uh, being received? Man in Mud, I'm sure many of you know, is this uh, wonderful sculpture which Thomas now installed in his birthplace, no? Uh, and it's a, I think it's a great metaphor of the artist, is a portrait of a man as a rhabdomant, uh, but with his legs stuck in mud. And um, I, I always think of it in relation to Boethi's self-portrait with the head uh, going up in smoke. And, um, but how did your hometown take such a comment, which is not very generous towards them, no? You make them look like they're stuck in mud. No, it's, it's, it's a very, very uh, interesting story. Uh, actually, I'm born in Oldenburg, which is uh, a nice uh, town, very remote in the north, 100,000 people, but pretty big cultural place. And somebody came with a design for a saving bank, for a headquarter of a saving bank, which is hundreds of years old, not the very oldest, but the very old saving bank. And he came in contact and he asked me and I proposed anything. I just cut something out, glue it in and said it. I was not really interested. So finally, uh, they said, yes, oh, very interesting, a six meter high sculpture out of bronze, I'll uh, do it. But the building was not standing, so I choose one circular spot where they planned a fountain, started the, the model, started in discussion with the chairman of the saving banks, and I think, listen, I propose Man in Mud as actually my first sculpture was big like this in the 80s. I proposed it, did several models, and she, I said, how you sell you to your clients a monument of being stuck? A monument normally is positive and yeah. not negative. 
or stuck is even worse than negative. A fallen soldier is easy uh, to digest, but to be stuck, oh, don't worry, uh, do it, we trust you, and it's very funny. <laughs> and they built a quite huge headquarter, and the architect became my friend, and uh, we still go out every week. And so it was six meters high out of styrofoam, which is quite a lot of stuff, a one-year work, modeling. In between, uh, the banks crashed <laughs> in the middle of the production, the Lehman Bank. So I couldn't sleep, and the next day I took, cut all the arms off, and I said, he has to do something, and put this... The rabdoman, yeah. How you call it? I think rhabdomancy stick, you not know, to find the water. The yeah, yeah. Um, I put him the stick in the hand, but he, we have to change all the steel construction. And uh, but at least he got something to do, and not being half naked in the wind or in the dirt. And he got more, much younger and much more relaxed. And suddenly he had something to do, looking for gold. <laughs> <laughs> but the funny thing is why I took this job and. I was lucky to have a quite high budget because a bronze this high costs as much as a building because there's structure inside, it's a one year work. And uh, I, I went several times and my grandmother was living in 200 meters away in all her life till the 80s. So I had a personal contact to this, and they treated me uh, so elegant for a saving banks, I was really uh, shocked, mm -hmm. positively shocked. There were meetings, and they wanted to discuss uh, the Bible with me. <laughs> Ethics. I mean, saving banks, they had an idea of religion, and not to make 10% uh, out of everything. So yeah, it yeah. was a very nice thing, and it immediately was accepted by the public. Actually, I never lived there. I was born there, but uh, immediately moved away. And it's, uh, it's very nice. Yeah. But again, the conditions were, were right. But actually, what I found out that you can't produce art or make art. You can make art happen. If the conditions are right, it's, you're pretty sure it happens. If the conditions are not really right, then you have to have uh, show business tricks or you have to have a lot of luck that things happen. Mm -hmm. the, the speaking now of the, the construction aspect of that sculpture, there is so much of your work um, is about materials no? and the research on, on materials, on bronze and ceramics and glass and uh, on many levels the, the richness of your practice is also this continuous experimenting with, uh, uh, with materials and uh, I'm curious to, to know how that works, if it's a trial and error or if it's more that you, you take on projects that allow you to, to expand the research on certain uh, materials like for example you've been recently doing a lot of things with glass that uh, are pushing further what can be done with it and they have the problem I know exactly what I want and <laughs> they have the problems I don't do research never yeah. ever I trust professionals and they start uh, 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 getting interested if it's a bit out of the way out of the standard and uh, I only work with, prof I don't have technical assistance. I, I trust the, the, the foundry, the glass people. Uh, I don't pay if I don't come. I don't have a huge staff. I have one and a half people. But I don't do research at all. It's high-end bricolage. Yeah. <laughs> but so you use the foundry and the, like, like your studios? Like you yeah, go I never there. have technical problems. It's, uh, I have a technical understanding, and now where it's where are the limits? Yeah. And good craftsmen, they love to invent things. Yeah. And then we try it out like boys playing around for three days, and then it's done. 
It's a high-end bricolage thing. Yeah. And, uh, but it never feels like you are delegating the realization. No, 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 no. I c control every step. Basically, do quite a lot of things by myself. And we don't never have too many technical failure. Now the recent glass heads they went wrong because Murano. Because they were Italians. No, yeah, they. <laughs> They love to invent things by themselves and say, no, 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 I need, I want a cast. And Murano is not good at casting, they're good on freestyle blowing, but uh, this I don't want, not till now. Yeah. So, uh, not why, because I'm afraid, but the process, glass has to cool down three days. And I cannot hang around three days to know what happened in 20 seconds or 20 minutes. Yeah. That's why I give them a strict job, and they have the problems. <laughs> but there's always some old guys who knows uh, how to handle this. Yeah. But it's no research. Huh? I no. never look at any book, or actually there's no book on doing patinas. You yeah. have to, I do it till this size, and uh, it's like Christmas. You never know what comes out. <laughs> I'll uh, change. Uh, topic a little bit and um, this is more of a talk show question but why are there so many monsters in your work because you don't see beauty <laughs> you look at the audience first <laughs> no you don't see beauty that's uh... no ugly stuff is much more easier yeah. nasty people it's really easy a beautiful woman is nearly impossible I tried it the full year yeah. It's in a very tiny booth here in, uh, in, on the art fair. But it's much more difficult to do uh, beautiful things. Yeah. Normally I'm balanced between workshop and watercolors. But since I have so many uh, talking, so much talking job, I'm in the evening, I'm so dead. Yeah. that I can't do the watercolors. <laughs> so we should stop. And, uh, no, but and, I, I no. try to do, I, yeah. I, I, I do flowers, and yeah. virtually nobody's doing it. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a test for the nerves, and they, I hope they are beautiful. At least and, I do my best. Yeah. And there are also lots of, uh, let's say, figures of authority in your work, not like fathers. And no, they, they are and, more uh, prominent, but uh, uh, I try to balance it. Yeah quite a lot. But it's not, again, I know you don't like to talk, but to me, maybe as an Italian, you know, when you, you, you make a, a piece like Faderstadt or, or like the Cardinals or uh, the Efficiency Man, it's, he also, f or the Dictator's Heads, it, it feels also like a, a, an engagement with a, a certain European history and a certain... They all come from Rome. They all Money, <laughs> money politi. Oh, yeah, the, the United I've been there, Animals, I've, I've uh, been there and yeah. at the end of the year they're all in jail, including the museum directors. <laughs> and I can go in the morning in the museums to see the Roman, the cardinals and all these Bellini sculptures and they are beautiful. And on the way home from the restaurant you can see the same people in the bus, in the bus or as a taxi driver. Yeah. It's a very simple thing. So it's but ugliness is much easier. Than, than beauty. That's, uh, don't look at me as you say that. <laughs> no, as an Italian, you should know. <laughs> yeah, we used to be good at beauty, but no, uh, not so much. So maybe, I mean, we, we are going to open up also the questions to, to the audience. I don't know if there is anything else that, that you, you know, one question that would be very obvious to ask you is what you're working on now and how the, the preparation of your show here is evolving and how in general you approach exhibitions, even though we, we understood that on many levels you think of it as a problem to solve and not so much a heroic, um, no, it's, creative... Uh, it's hard work and you have to be really organized and structured. I do four shows in fall, one at the private Museum in Berlin, it's all about prints. Against my will, but I help. Then I do uh, 
a traveling show all these women on tables. The Rivoli show comes to Folkwang Museum Essen in mid-September. But it's all set. I just have to design the architecture and install it. Then I do uh, the Bayerle thing. It's 95% uh, uh, decided, but not yet done. And it's all about figures. And there the limits are pretty high. So the level is very high. You cannot make a stupid jokes. And next door, there's a Matisse that doesn't work. <laughs> and pretty much outside in the park. And we will see the book is, the books are always quite a lot of work. Yeah. Because if constantly working on it, not just slam it together and then print it. And text is awful lot of work to produce just a normal five pages text. And then at the end of October, I do a, a architectural retrospective in Luzern, which I didn't care too much. It's also some kind of a traveling show. And that's why I'm happy that you didn't invite me for a Biennale. <laughs> well, I because <laughs> I really didn't have time. No, I know. I have to say that this is a... Like when I went to see Thomas last summer, uh, he's the only artist that I visited and I was officially already the director of the Biennale. He's the only artist who didn't let me come into the studio. I'd been other times to the studio, but this time it, no, we just went for Sunday dinner. Evening, we no, went no, just for dinner. Possible. And then he told me something terribly terrifying because he said the most important thing is not to make mistakes. Because if you make a mistake, then you have to start again. And um, I've been thinking a lot about it as I was preparing the show, but it's... Um, no, it's much more simple. You have to make good mistakes and are a be able to learn of them. That's if you go to Pardo, which I was recently. If you look at 15 Titian and 10 Tintorettos, it's disastrous for an artist. You spend the whole day in bed to digest it. But yeah. from bad art, you can really learn a lot. From really good art, you don't know. It's better uh, stop it now. <laughs> but the, the good, they are good mistake and unproductive yeah. mistakes. But I didn't mean it personally. You know? no, no. But you got very good press. The German press was very yeah, positive. Yeah, but, it's, um, <laughs> but let's talk about you. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the, the, I mean, the one question I want to ask you, because you, you mentioned the, the women uh, exhibition, which was in Turin and then traveling. And uh, often when, when people discuss the, the women series, they, they mention Mayol and they mention, I mean, you mentioned Matisse. It's quite unusual for an artist uh, of your generation, whatever it means, uh, that people read your work in relation to masters of modern art. Uh, you know, if you think of people your age or people uh, that are in the show business uh, with you, it's often their work is uh, interpreted as a clear cut from history. And with your work instead, maybe it's the critic's fault, but there is a, a tendency to, to think of your work in relation to tradition and sometimes also to complicated traditions. Like Mayol is an artist that I don't think contributes to any debate today. And so I, I want to... It doesn't know. matter at all. Yeah. It's not a fashion. We are not in fashion. That's the other, that's the other the part. The other business. <laughs> uh, I do the research afterwards. Because as an artist or as you, you have a huge memory of situations, of paintings, but you really don't know. And to, do, to read a book three years later, that's really fascinating to find where, where everything, where the roots are, where you come from, if you want it or not, it can be really disappointing. And, uh, but I basically first trust my instinct, do it at a sketch, and then it's a slow process to make it in big. But this only happened because I became a father and had to stay home. I cannot disappear every single week, so I had uh, tried to convince my caster to give me a place where I can model. Not many artists produce in, in foundries. They bring things, cut it apart, 
cast it and put it together. So this was the main bio, uh, uh, biological uh, uh -huh. reason, biographical reason, not to be on the road all the time, but to constantly, and this woman's sculptures went up to nine months production time, actually with help, but I tried to be more and more uh, involved. And the series of the ghosts just stopped there because I was not involved anymore. I made 18, and by accident I made 18 women. And right now I try to do little, this size heads in between. But it was so terribly cold the last five months that I couldn't hardly but do, do you, anything. But do you think, for example, like with a series like The Women, do you consciously think you want to make a sort of anachronistic work? or? No, no. Because you are I, a, a contrarian, and I say with gra great respect. Now, you, you like to do what others are not doing, and you like to say no in a... There's no reason for silliness. I, yeah. I, I, I was shocked in Torino how these things fit together, yeah. and decided that the whole things keep together and be the, the, the grounding stones for a foundation. The whole things that I own is one is now in the foundation and will be there forever. Yeah. And uh, it, it's instinct, you never know. You cannot control it, you cannot read it in the book, you cannot talk about it, how one step goes after the other in the, in the rush of eight years. But sometimes it's 25 years. And uh, you never know where you're coming out. Yeah. And since I can afford not to do mass production or to do traffic signs or uh, and I'm happy that the galleries now understand that I cannot feed them every single every single year uh, I have the situation to be independent and can move like I want and I can turn on a penny I'm not obliged to uh, repeat myself I can choose, and I'm uh, getting more and more ignorance to pressure. I don't react on this. Yeah. So shall we ask if they have any question or? <laughs> I guess we should. <laughs> don't. You're out of themes. No, I have plenty. I can continue. I can ask you, well, no, one element is uh, because you're saying that works that continue, for example, for 25 years, another very peculiar aspect of your work, which is often, and I'm not saying because you're here, it's often a sign of great artists, is the way in which they can continue work on a set of problems throughout time. And I think in your case, there are series that that you continue for 20 years and then maybe they disappear for a while and then they continue again like the United Enemies or um, so I'm curious also how or, or even with the architecture how they uh, some motives you go back and develop them more and more in depth and, uh, and so one question is how does that work in depth evolves uh, and when do you decide a series is done for you I have a very organized archive. The analog archive, I, I'm the only who touch it, so each project has a folder. Everything comes in, the letters, the faxes, and tons of emails. Now, after computer times, before they have everything subject on one piece of paper. Now you have 25 emails with half sentences. So I have problems with my analog archive, and I have a, somebody employed who does a digital archive. And if you have everything in order, I can pull out something from the 80s and it's there immediately. It's not forgotten. So I can easily continue strings and knit it together. But where it comes out, I don't know. There is, a, I think, an eternal compass mm -hmm. where to go and where not to go which is much sometimes more important.
what not to do. But there is a compass that decides what happens. Yeah. So now we should really even yeah, people out of, leaving. Because we don't let them ask questions. Now, now the we chair should, starts. No, it's almost an hour. Yeah. So maybe we yes, we let the Yeah, if you can stand up and there is a microphone. Oh well, not your specific case, but in general if you can stand up. <laughs> um, uh, listening to uh, way, when you describe the process of your work, s s talking about instinct, when I look to your work, I see an enormous culture behind you, but a lot of intuition. <clears throat> Are you intuitive artist? Yeah, till now I found my way home pretty okay. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Judy Holm with Blue Media out of Miami, Florida. Thank you very much for your uh, beautiful conversations this morning. My question is, uh, do you have any either sporadic or regular influences culturally when you do your creation, whether it be literary, musical, or other cultural connections? I travel quite a lot, but not the Far East and not Florida. <laughs> when I'm drawing, I basically listen to music because the song, the song structure is very interesting for watercolors. The, the song gives you five minutes to finish, then five minutes for smoking, five minutes for drawing. So I can produce an album in uh, 90 minutes, if I'm lucky, but only happens twice a year. But the influence is not much. I'm not reading anything. I stopped the movies completely, zero TV. But I talk to a lot of people. So they tell me all the stories. But I, I'm too lazy to go to Cambodia and run around in the jungle. I, I'm, I'm, I'm too busy with myself to uh, enjoy like books or... I think I have a two meter pile of unopened books. Still the plastic around. <laughs> It's a pity, but I don't have the patience. But now you also make a, a, a book a year in the last... No, no I did like four books. You are the most, uh, yeah, the most active lazy person I know. Because yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I come on 12 hours sleep a day. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so you did four books in the last year, no? Yeah, it was a bit much, yeah. yeah. But this, you cannot really control the publishers or the museums. They need a book. I don't personally don't need yeah. books, yeah. But it's a nice gift. Yeah. <laughs> it sells, books don't sell. They never cover the cost. But it, it's, it's nice to distribute information. Yeah. But nowadays, people travel so much that you do a, pine, a tiny thing in the backyard of a house and everybody pulls out his iPhone and in 10 minutes, it's around the world. Yeah. It's pretty, uh, pretty strange to have a mass media and you really don't, can't control it yeah. with the iPhone photos. Huh? Uh, you told me, though, that a Walter de Maria sculpture has a stronger luminosity than the screen of an iPhone. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I remember you t telling I your children that, and I was very, very impressed. <laughs> Any other question? Amazing, no qu you scare them, Tom. <laughs> well, 
Rainer Piemanshofer from Austria, journalist. How are you handling the pricing of your artwork? You mean the money? <laughs> or the pricing? pricing. Yeah, first of all, 95% of the artists don't live on their work. That's a fact. 80% of the artwork is sold once and never again. So I'm, I'm one of the happy few half a percent of artists. And since I produce everything, I can calculate. But what's here, it's basically second hand, I don't get anything. And I, uh, I'm not against it. And it doesn't make much sense to control a wild market. Everybody has to live, so everybody doubles the price. And from, if a major sculpture something is like $100,000, I have, after tax, I have 12%, so that's not so much. But I see it with, uh, uh, with mixed feelings, like always. But I don't have to. That's my f favorite. I don't have to sell. No, I live on the pieces that I didn't sell. So I can make four shows just for my stock. And museum can afford a show. If they have to send 50 trucks to get 50 people, 50 pieces, no museum can afford it. But if they pick it up with two trucks just from one address, I can do a show. That's, uh, that's how I survive on not selling, or not selling too much, keeping things. And since 10 years, I keep more than half of my production. You're your biggest collector. No, I don't collect. I, I, in the evenings, I collect myself, yeah, but. Uh, <laughs> That's why I like, now I like high prices, because I can keep my things. But there's plans to make it, to make a building, to make it public. And it can be really f going fast now within this year, or it can take some time. But basically the art fair, uh, Conor Fisher told this 20 years ago, when I showed up in Paris in an art fair and was no good sales. No. He said, listen, this is not an artist fair, this is an art fair, so please piss off. <laughs> <laughs> because there are all these artists controlling prices. In the old times, there were prices on the wall. And the many, many artists came and controlled uh, if, if they're cheating or not. But I hope the, 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 uh, the tendency that Art is a luxury good, disappears into more uh, serious direction. It not ju no artists are doing work to sell it. There's other, there are many more other reasons than to make money. Yeah. There, each successful piece has another reason to be in the world because it's not there. And to make a copy of a coffee in a re replica of a replica, it, it can be funny for a year or two, but in the end, it doesn't make sense. But what's adding another zero are the auctions houses who have their own interest. And uh, I tell you, half of the provenance are wrong. These people print things, irresponsible. They invent. Last time they put the Giacometti next to me and the De Koning sculpture, they invent history. They put some creepy guys, they don't have a name, invent a selling philosophy. And now I, I, I sent them my royal company and say, listen, you have to pay for the photos. You cannot ever steal everything. And they don't believe if it's, if it's more than a million, at least, 
the text should be right, <laughs> or the material should be right, or the provenance should be right, but it's not true. But they're working on a hype till it fails. But this I see a bit problematic. But on the other hand, I don't interfere too much. So the fair starts now in 21 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> you should run. <laughs> <coughs> there was another question out, up there. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about humor in your work. Is it just a transference of your personality into your work, or do you use it as a way to easily engage an audience, or am I totally off? <laughs> no, that's new. It's hard training. <laughs> Jokes are the most difficult work, but it took me long, long years to uh, achieve this. Before I was always an angry, ang I was an angry young man and had a lot of trouble, but I think uh, humor is one of the best things to survive. But it's hard work. <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Sinam, I am from Istanbul. Um, I am a gallery director in Istanbul and I am quite keen on the collectors, collections of the collectors, so I always wonder the collections, art collections of the artists. So I assume you have one, and if you have one collection, what is your favorite piece in your collection? Thank you. I didn't really understood it. You mean my favorite collectors? No, if you have a collection. Uh, if you have a if you collect collection. What is your favorite piece in your collection? What is the favorite artwork? Uh, I have a Bruce Nauman drawing, two meters big. I traded with my gallery, Conrad Fischer, and he said, I can't sell a Bruce Nauman in German. And it's in German a, 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 a language, a, a written piece called Hope and Envy, but in German, so it didn't sell. <laughs> I traded it, but it's not up in the moment. Yeah. I stopped buying art, it's too exhausting. <laughs> it's really exhausting to go uh, to friends and get uh, hundreds of drawings. It's very easy with photographers. I have a set of, uh, of Thomas Rolf, Thomas Struth, <coughs> big boxes. But it's really a, a different job. I don't have the patience anymore to go because you have to discuss it. I never trade it, but I used to buy uh, quite a lot of things, basically, to help people. But I don't do it anymore. Do you teach or no? No, I have, I have three kids. And I don't want to be responsible for, for young students. I don't. Now with the open media, you can get information everywhere. You can knock on every door, and I talk to everybody, but I don't want to be in a state institutions and uh, I did it once actually in the late '80s. This was interesting, but it's, you always see the limit. So I'm not teaching. Maybe last question? No? Uh, my name is Aram Gwak. I'm a journalist from Seoul, Korea. I have a question to Mr. Jioni. Uh, as a director of the Venice Biennale, which is a very uncommercial event, what do you think of this kind of very commercial event like at Bazaar or at Fair? Um, you know, it's... Um, in Italian, we have a good word, which is manichean. I don't know if you say that in English as well, like a clear-cut 
distinction. Unfortunately, I'm not Manichaean, and, I'm, and I think we live in a world that is not clear cut. So, of course, I tried to do a, a biennial that was very, as different as I could from an art fair, and uh, uh, I tried to do a biennial that put an emphasis on uh, uh, art and artists that have also cultivated a, a form of isolation, let's say, and have done work with or without recognition. So, um, and, and I actually always, when I make shows, I try to make the kind of show that cannot be made elsewhere. So I think, for example, nowadays, there are so many occasions where to see the new uh, that I felt that this biennial had to include also the past and include very different materials because there are art fairs, there are museums, there are galleries where you can see the new, but there aren't many places where you can see more uh, unusual objects, and uh, on the other hand, I'm not, uh, I'm not against the market. I'm not uh, coming here to to criticize. Of course, I, I, you know, there is a great writer who's also in the exhibition uh, in Venice. His name was uh, Roger Calois, and he says that when he visited the museum in Seoul the first time when they opened the National Museum, he saw people genuflecting in front of uh, the Buddha sculpture in the museum because the power of the Buddha was so strong that even in a museum, people would look at it as a sacred object. And uh, I, what I try to do in shows is that people go through the show without thinking of the price of the object, but thinking of its power. and. Uh, um, and I don't know if I succeed or not, but I think that's also what our responsibility is. And uh, here, people come to ask for prices. In other places, I hope they come to look at the power of the artwork, which is not reflected in the price. And of course, it's pathetic I'm saying this at an art fair. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this is enough. Well, I, unless there is a last question for Thomas, he should end, not me, but. No, I think it was a good ending. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, thank to the Basel Arthur. <laughs>